So welcome everybody to another episode of Macklin's Take with me, Andy Clark and Matt Macklin. It's our second episode of the week because it's pay-per-view week. We heard from Jerry Eisenberg earlier in the week and that was that was enormous fun. Um, Jerry's been covering boxing for 70 years. Just let that sink in, 70 years. And over the course of that time, he's he's been ringside for most of the iconic fights you can think of. Certainly within the period from about 1960 to... 2000, that, that, that mere 40 year period, um, the, the fight of the century, the rumble in the jungle, the thriller in Manila. He was there for all of those. Uh, he knew all the people involved and talking to him was, it was, it was an experience that, that you know, not that many people get because there aren't that many people still left quite honestly, who've been around for, for that period of time. So we love that. Uh, today we move it on to the, to the modern heavyweight era. Um, and someone who's heavily involved in, in the main event on Saturday, Derek Tizora against Joseph Parker, because he's leading Joseph Parker's corner. Not something he probably would have anticipated happening um, until just a few weeks ago, really, because that that pairing, that partnership came out of the blue. Uh, Joseph Parker was still with Kevin Barry when he boxed Junior Far back at the end, back at the end of, of February. So you'll have guessed who uh who today's guest is. He's making his third appearance on Macklin's Take, which puts him level with Barry Jones. So so he and Barry Jones are kind of our interim gold regular champions. Our super champ, our super champ is still John Pegg because uh, John's, John's been on four times. Um, um, not for a while though. So we probably, need to, we probably need to do something about that. Andy Lee in the bubble, isolating, bored out of his mind. How are you? I'm delighted for the for the occupation here. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm in the bubble, and um, I was saying to Matthew before. I'm not sure how people must do the two weeks you know after returning from flights because um, you'd really miss the fresh air. Um, but thankfully, and all going well, we'll be out tomorrow and able to con- congregate. But not that we will be doing that. Um, it's always always I don't know always a weird feeling around the fight hotels, isn't it? Because you're likely to bump into your opponent and don't want to give nothing away. You're looking at other teams, seeing what they're up to. You know, it's it's, a, it's an interesting environment to be in. So, uh, yeah, I'm do- otherwise I'm doing fine. Uh, the training's been great. Joseph's been great. Yeah, the quick came around like we didn't know each other eight weeks ago. And uh, here I am leading him into probably, well, it's not the biggest fight of his life. He's had bigger fights, but one of the most important fights, I think, at this time in his career. So, how did it, how did it all kind of, all kind of happen? Because it was, um, yeah, I mean, when, when when it happened, it was it was pretty surprising. I think I messaged Matt and uh, and said, "Did you know nothing about this?" And he just said, "No, no, I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't have the faintest idea about this." So, I mean, him and Kevin Barry seem fairly. You know that seemed like a father something kind of going on there. Really, um, you would have put money probably on those two staying together for for the rest of his career. So what? Um, yeah, what happened? Not with them, but how how did he come to you? Um, I had been in been in Malcolm for a lot of January and February, um, just training Tyson as we just Tyson. He just wanted me to come over and do some work with him just to keep it things fresh and. Um, I think just give him something to do where really, they keep him company and, <laughs> and uh, change up his, his dynamic with there. And we did some training. And off the back of that, I was that was I got home on a Sunday and then a Friday morning he called me and said, Andy, will you train Joseph Parker? And I was like completely out of blue. And um, we had I talked about what type of fighter he is, what type of fighter he is. I'd, I'd always watched him, obviously, but uh, from a distance, you know, uh, Joseph Parker never really took a great interest in him. So that night I spoke to Joseph and his manager, David Higgins, on over Zoom and a few more Zooms over the weekend. And then on the Wednesday, um, from talking to him on the Friday night and the Wednesday afternoon, he landed in Dublin. And um, yeah, we, we got straight down to work, went straight to the gym. And um, yeah, we've been working every, together every day since. I think, of- David, I think David Higgins' is, mom is from Newmarket and Fergus and Clare. That's not a million miles from you, Andy, is it? It's funny because, uh, yeah, he's actually, David's not at this fight this time. He's expecting his first baby. And with the quarantine rules in New Zealand, it's very hard to get back into the country. Then you have to do two weeks in the hotel. So he's going to stay home. But his cousin 
who's been to all Joseph's fights, is here from Newmarket on Fergus and it's in the room down the hallway. Yeah, so close connection there, yeah. <laughs> It's a sh- it's a shame David Higgins isn't around because I- I'm a big Higgins fan, um, big Higgins fan, uh, and that that um, that bubble you've got going on there at the minute with 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 the Eubanks and the Hattons and and Chisora and the people like that, there is no bubble or, or situation that cannot be improved in my opinion by the presence of David Higgins. Um, so, <laughs> how would you describe him? In, how would you describe him in one word, Andy? Unusual, probably. <laughs> Entertaining would be another one. The, the first time, the, the first time I encountered David Higgins was um, it, it was definitely Fantastic. the most. It, it, it was definitely the most unusual, um, yeah, the most unusual incident I've been involved in in my career. So I, I was I was chairing the the press conference for Joseph Parker against Huey Fury, uh, which was um, the fight was in Manchester, but the press conference was in in London at the Landmark, I think, and. So there's a place next to me for David Higgins and I'd never actually met him. Um, so I kind of thought I probably knew what he would look like, but, but, but I'd never seen him in the flesh. And anyway, nobody took, nobody took it. Um, so there was Joseph on my right, Kevin Barry on the far right, um, Mick Hennessy, Huey Fury, Peter Fury, and this empty chair for David Higgins. So it was just, just, just cracked on. We were, we were underway. And then there was a bit of a commotion at the back and the door opened. Um, and these two fellas came kind of like stumbling in, um, you know, a bit tired and emotional, I think would be would be the way to to describe it. Shit faced would be would be another way to describe it. Um, and I thought, is that David Higgins? I wasn't really sure because I'd never actually seen him before in real life. I thought, I think that's David Higgins. And I thought, is that Franz Boater? <laughs> and it was Franz Boater. And they kind of came towards the front and then started arguing with Peter Fury, which is never a great idea, I don't think. Um, I wouldn't have thought. Um, he told them to to get out, and then security kind of bustled them out, and it was all over. It was all very surreal, but um, but yeah, he was kind of an instant hit with me after that because he managed to liven up what up until that point had been quite a you know run of the mill press conference and turn it into something completely different. Um, he always, anyway, he always, not- he always seems to me like he's taking the piss, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely got yeah i mean that day he sort of uh, yeah I, I think that that's how i would describe what he was up to that day but you know all of these characters um provide their own stitches to the great tapestry that is uh the great embroidery that is that is that is boxing is it different training i know you've worked with tyson obviously is it different training a heavyweight is it a lot different training a heavyweight than it is to training jason quigley or or, or, or paddy donovan uh, i mean i guess it i guess it is is it Joe's a very athletic um, heavyweight. You know, he's not a big uncoordinated like robot. You know, so he can do a lot of things that they can do. The obviously the philosophy stays the same. The the way you speak to them stays the same. A lot of the technique is the same. Um, but yeah, they are bigger men. They do hit harder. Um, like with Tyson and Joseph, they are very coordinated guys, so they can do things unusual for big men. You know, they can do, they can, you can ask them to do certain moves or certain punches or even like circuits or leg circuits or arm circuits. They can do those things because they're pretty much athletic. You know what I mean? Whereas somebody like, I don't know, I, I don't want to name anybody, but someone who might not be as coordinated or as, or as yes. you know, athletic might not be able to do it, you know? So, no, Joseph's. Joss has done everything like the lads do, really. Um, there are a lot of cross, yeah, you, a lot of things say the same in terms of the messages you get, try to get across. But a lot of, some things maybe not, maybe not the same volume of punches. That's all, really. Yeah, he's, he's quite athletic, isn't he? Mm, yeah, he's well able, like, he's a, he's, a, he's agile. And uh, so that's, that's the main thing. He doesn't have any, like, you know, some tall guys, they have knee problems, they can't. Can't jump. He can't run. He can't do X, Y, and Z. But he can do it all. So, yeah, he's, he's easy to train. So, when you take on somebody new, it, it, it's kind of an interesting dynamic that way. You, you've you've spoken to him, and and you know everything's on Zoom at the minute, and it would have been anyway because he's on, you know, he's on he's on the other side of the world. I mean, but but it's always possible that you can kind of you can click with someone as a as a person, um, and then when you get in the gym, it just doesn't really 
work. You, you hear that from trainers sometimes, and that's true of any walk of life, isn't it? You can you can get on with somebody outside of work, and then when it comes to the office, it just doesn't really happen for some reason. So that first session you had with him, were you a bit kind of was that in your mind at all that that that, that, that you know you had a good start, but this this he's come all the way over here, and this this there's no guarantees this will work. Um, I think as long as they're committed and they buy into it, you know, and Joe did that, I think he took on board what I, what I said and he tried it. And after a while, he started to see that it worked or that he was benefiting from it. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't know, you know, Ma- Matthew would tell you like boxers, they're like lie detectors, you know, they know who's bullshit and they know who's real and what's, you know, and they know what's going to benefit them or they, if it makes sense to them, you know, sometimes you get a coach and you tell you to do the X, Y, and Z and you don't, they can't tell you why they, why you're doing that. It's just that they always, you know, they always do it that way. But if you can tell a fighter why he's doing stuff and why it will benefit them, then I think that's a big part of, you know, them buying into it. And he has been committed. Like you don't get more committed, obviously flying across the world, leaving everything, your family, and then um, coming to a trainer who he doesn't know, but, Oh, he's, he's bought straight into it. And I, I believe he's improved a lot. I believe he's improved a lot. Now, this fight, like, it's been a short period of time that we've had to train together. And I know from my own experience that going to a new trainer and learning new things, they take time to embed, you know, to become ingrained or become instinctual. And in this fight, he will be put under pressure. You know, he'll be in the situation, he will be stressed. So he may revert back to his old way of doing things. But at that, he still wasn't a bad fighter, you know. It's not like he's coming in off a loss or anything. He's coming in off of a good win, I think, even though he might have got criticised for the fire loss. I think Junior Farr is a good... Like he's top 10 heavyweight and would beat a lot of guys and had a good strategy and a good game plan for that fight. A, a, another interesting scenario about, about this is that Trezor is in the same situation. He's He's got a new trainer. Uh, he's got a new trainer, one that, that Matt knows well, one we might speak to over the course of the next couple of days so it's yeah similar situation for both for both fighters I mean have you when you've got that short a period of time um, you're obviously going to point out things that you think need changing but are you kind of wary of trying to change to, to, to kind of wary of trying to be too radical in that in that in that shorter period yeah. of time and what that what can that can do is create doubt in the fighter's mind and make him start thinking, you know, start feeling down about himself. Um, and so you just try to, like, I remember when I went with Emmanuel, after about six months, you know, someone from home room said, oh, is he, what's he doing? Which is he changed his style. And I said, he doesn't, hasn't changed my style. I think I'm fighting exactly the same as I did. But then when I will look back, at that stage, look back at my amateur fights, I look, it was completely different, you know? So I think it's, it's about tweaking and evolving, but, um, yeah, just you don't try and change everything because it's such a short period of time, and he's still got a, no, he's got a fight soon. So, but I would interested, Matthew. You know, from your experience with Buddy, what do you think he will add to Cesaro? Give us the inside, inside line. <laughs> oh, you know, from a style point of view, I wouldn't have put them together. Do you know what I mean? Like Buddy's very textbook, stylist, everything after jab. You know, Cesaro's really a walk you down type of guy, isn't he? Bob and Weave, get inside, work the body. But but he's very calm in the corner, you know, very relaxed, reads the fight well, and he's good at talking you through it. I mean, your game plan is your game plan and you're instinctive in there. You have to be able to read the fight yourself, of course. But you come back to the corner, you get a minute. He he just, he doesn't bombard you. He keeps it simple. But I I always felt he was very good in the corner. Maybe that was... I found the best part of it was in the corner that he probably brought. Well, I don't think you need Buddy for 10 weeks in a camp or anything like that. I don't, I think he get bored and he doesn't need to be there that long. I just think that he's, uh, he's very calm, very relaxed, very experienced, reads the fight well. And like I said, I think he's very good in the corner. So I think, I think he'll be good from that point of view. I don't think he's going to change his aura from a style point of view or, or even add anything. I think his aura is what he is. As you're saying there, you know, you got eight weeks with someone, Joseph, and he's sold on everything. He's come over. That's a big commitment to do that. So he obviously believes in you and he's committed to making it work. But even with that, there's only so much you can achieve in eight weeks, isn't there? You know, and like you say, you're going to come under pressure and stress on the night. Mate, and he might, you might revert to type or you might keep some of it. So it's um, like, you, you, I know you change trainers. 
eventually you went with Adam Booth. It's, and it takes a while, doesn't it, to, to get into the new way of things. I, I tried trying this several times. So, but I always tried to be teachable. You know, I did, when I went with someone, I, I tried to be sold on what they were teaching me. Otherwise, what was the point in me spending the money going over to America if I wasn't going to be sold on it? Do you know what I mean? But even at that, it, it, it still it still takes a, a bit of time. And I, I remember, actually, funnily enough, the first time I trained with Buddy uh, for Uruguay Campus, I was trying new things. I was getting caught between styles a bit. I don't think I won around inspiring, <laughs> because, and which wasn't great for my confidence necessarily going into the fight. Do you know what I mean? So it's it can be a balance, balancing act. Is is there a point which do you think maybe you go or a fighter gets to where they're they're no longer really teachable, or or they're they're no longer really kind of changeable? Um, He's always kind of in his late thirties, and and what you just said there about Buddy being really good on the night that that sort of makes sense. Like you look at the fighters he's been in with, um, or he's trained. You know, some big names there: Kovalev, um, Arturo Gatti, uh, Tava, Paulie. I think, yeah, Paulie for 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 at least a, a spell. Uh, yourself, of course, um, <laughs> and. But it's kind of an old school thing, that in a way, isn't it? You look at someone like Angelo Dundee, and people probably said that about him was was that he was great on the night, um, yeah, the last few weeks, and great on the night. And and buddy, I listened to the podcast he did with Tris Tris Dixon uh, a couple of days ago, and that I think he'd probably agree with you actually if you asked him that 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 probably was the main strength for him. So is he kind of ideal for someone like Chisora is an incredibly long winded point I'm making, which is that he's not going to try and change too much because maybe you can't change Del Boy at this stage. Yeah. Del, Del Boy is what he is now. He's not going to change now. The, the, the longer you're in your, you're into your career, the harder, it, you know, it's hard teaching old dog new tricks, isn't it? Things get ingrained in you. And I'm not saying change can't happen, but it takes time and you'll probably only achieve so much per fight, you know what I mean? And you'll maybe take a bit more than the next one. The next one, so over a period of time, you can make bigger changes. But over a, a month or a six-week period or whatever for one fight, it'd be very difficult, especially where Dalboy is in his career. But that said, I do think he, I do think he'll be a positive addition because of his experience and his calmness and all that sort of stuff. And he's very, very good in the corner. So I think I think it's a, a smart move. Um I don't think you're going to see the whole boy boxing on the back foot. You know what I mean? But I think, I think you know, but it, 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 it's going to be a hard fight, isn't it? This is going to be a tough fight, which for both men, I think. And having that someone experienced and calm talking you through it, who you respect and trust, that, 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 that can only be a bonus. What about you, Andy? Do you think there's... Everybody's different, aren't they? But, but do you think there is... Is it the case that you get to a point where all fighters get to a point where they kind of they are what they are and and there's not really that much more you can you can do technically maybe or or physically? I, I don't know. I think I don't know. I just, I think fighters are always looking to learn. You know, the, I think they're and they're always trying to get an edge and they're always they're thirsty for knowledge. You know, they they want it. They're hungry for it. I think I. I like whether they're physically capable of changing, it, you know, uh, the will and you know uh, having the will to, ch- to to want to change, but also being able to do. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think Buddy might add some a little bit more nuance to like they might not be as crude or as you know might have a little bit maybe even if he adds one or two moves to their Jazar about how to close distance a bit better or how to you know with the way he steps his lead foot. Um, then he'll have an it'll be a positive effect on him, you know. But like Matthew says, there's training the guy, um, getting him physically fit and teaching him technique. But then there's also being a cornerman, which is a completely different skill as well. And that's what Buddy is very good at, you know. And something um, I, I I believe I'm very good on the technical side, and I'll have to prove myself in the corner yet. So like I, for most of the fighters I've worked with, I've been in the corner of a heavily favoured fighter. And you might say, Joe, this is a heavily favoured fighter this time, but this is a big fight. And it might be 50-50, it might be 60-40 for Joseph, but it's, it's still a very close fight. So, And in a big, bigger bigger arena, I guess, in terms of the media and people watching around the world. And in terms of 
approaching training for this fight with Joseph, obviously you're teamed up, he's coming over. I'm guessing that you're thinking, right, eight weeks, we'll work back as we'll spar at this point, we'll do this. You, you know what I mean? You're kind of working out how you, what the guideline of the, the, the training regime will be. Obviously, it's very different to someone like Paddy Donovan, who's turning pro. You teach him to probably sit down on his shots. You're, you're really kind of, you know, it's like, he's like putting your hands a little bit, isn't he? You can mould him, his style and everything. Obviously, Joseph's already, you know, achieved so much. He's, he's already got things ingrained. What was that like, you know, for your own mental, before you even started training, what, how did, what kind of challenges did you think you were going to face with that? I, I just watched him, watched all these fights, and I, I could see two or three things that I could change straight away that would improve him, you know? And um, that, like I, and I, I know from my own experiences, being around Emmanuel for all those years and being with Adam, um, and how to like prepare a camp and how to manage a fighter and, and to make sure he's peaking at the right stage. Like, you'll know, Matthew, you'll know maybe your own experiences then from listening and talking to the fighters that how they prepare for fights is never like you'd be surprised. A lot of these big fighters and how they prepare for fights, like some of it is crazy. The stuff they do, you can get up to before fights or how they train, even. And, um, and like when I Show him Joseph basic things, you know, basic things that I would have learned years ago or things that you take for granted and you realise he's never done it before, never been shown or how to do it or why he does a certain thing. You know, it's 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 really like it's surprising, you know, it's surprising that and and it's credit to him really because he's been world champion without ever having to throw a right hand properly, you know, <laughs> like really. Yeah, I mean yeah, one, one thing I always I never one thing I realised when I used to go down to Crystal Palace first, there's, you know, uh, Young England, the under-19s, and then onto the senior thing, and most of the stuff that you worked on in those squad training sessions were basics. But, it was, but in, in terms of doing the basics, okay, doing them well, doing them very well, and doing them, you know, as close to perfect as you can get. There's big differences then in the performance. It's as simple as that. You know, boxing is a simple sport, really. You know what I mean? But it's 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 doing things... It's getting those basics, getting them done properly, you know, can make a big impact in how you perform. Someone like Joseph, who's already a very, very good heavyweight, good fighter, got all that experience, fast hands, good footwork, well, improved footwork now, but you change one or two small little things about him and he becomes, you know, an elite heavyweight all of a sudden. And like, in terms of, uh, like, I have nothing, nothing to hide. Like, the one thing I, the first thing I changed with him was where um, his distribution of his weight and where he's, he was always leaning over the front foot and that was a very lazy posture to take because he was a lazy fighter and he would switch off like so the first thing i got him to do was to sit more on his back foot and i know that that will make him more upright but it's also it takes him away from his from the opponent's punches and it makes him work his back leg and have more proficient back leg like a back leg but like the best fighters, Matthew, like you said, it's about the simple things right but also being disciplined in that and being disciplined in your concentration for every second of the round. The best fighters are just switched on all the time. They don't have any lapses. They don't look for any breaks. They don't look for clinches. They don't look for, you know, I'll do this, 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 and then I'll just walk away and have a little rest. Or, you know, they're always on, switched on, switched on. And that's what we've been working on. Um, how to tra transfer his weight when he punches, to make him more powerful, to use his shoulders. Um, simple, simple things. But like I said, all those things, they add up and they make make you what you are, make you a good fighter. Yeah, and, and if you're not, you, that's something you have to do every single day in the gym, isn't it? Every single day when you're on the badge, when you're shadow boxing, when you're on the mitts, the pads, sparring, because you're not going to suddenly do it on the night if you haven't been doing it for the last eight weeks. Yeah, and listen, it could be the last eight years, he still has to keep practicing it, you know what I mean? It's, it's something you just said there, though, um, and you said it quite matter-of-factly, that the top fighters are just always switched on Some, something I was wondering about recently is how how do you achieve that kind of this could be a good example of something that I would think about and obsess about and you two just wouldn't because you've done this and I haven't but how do you go about getting yourself into that kind of mental state where you can be switched on all the time without just nervous energy flooding out of you and you being absolutely done after about three or four rounds. Because for, for, for a normal person like me, 
that suggests that you're you're existing in this state of hypertension all the time if you're switched on in the ring. But that obviously that can't be how it is. Um, I don't know if you have to answer that. I think it's about control. Box is all about control. Controlling your emotions, controlling controlling yourself. You know, boxing is about control, like internally. It's about being in control of yourself. It's the only thing you can control. And um, it's yeah, it's about focus, being focused on but not being not being tense. So like there's a difference between being tense and tight, but I'm being focused and being cool and calm. And and especially under fire, you know, to stay cool and calm in those in those situations. Yeah, I mean that's it literally, I mean that it's mastering being focused, being switched on, being, you know, in concentrated, but at the same time relaxed, where you're not burning up nervous energy. You, you know what I mean? You can't there's no good relaxing but being lackadaisical and switching off. Do you know what I mean? Because then you're going to get hit with shots and you're not going to be sharp. But then there's no good being sharp and switched up, but tense and burning loads of energy because you're going to you're not going to last. It's, it's, that's what I mean. It's that balance. That's what I mean. That 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 seems because you see, for someone who hasn't done it or hasn't been in that sort of similar situation, those two things seem like they're in direct contrast. Like being relaxed is being relaxed, and being switched on is being switched on. But you have to be both at the same time. And that that was kind of my point. It's just that's quite a hard thing to get your head around. It is a contradiction, but that's the thing. It's a bit like, you know, that scene in Ocean's Eleven where he says, you know, don't look him in the eye, but don't look away either. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? yeah, yeah. He has to remember you and forget you in the in the, in, in oh. 10 seconds. That was it, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing oh. in boxing. You've got to be relaxed, but not lackadaisical. Do you know what I mean? You've got to be focused, but don't be burning energy. It's, it's And I suppose that's experience. You get over-experience. You get comfortable at being uncomfortable. And that's where you're kind of sitting pretty then. So in terms of so something, you, something you said a few minutes ago, Andy, you, you were saying that, you know, you think on the technical side of, of, of the training, um, uh, you rate yourself highly. But but when it comes to in the corner on the night, you you can't really give yourself a mark yet because you haven't kind of had that baptism. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me because, you know, when when when... When the shit is flying in that corner in between rounds, I mean, that what a place to be that must be. You know, I'm 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 fascinated by it because you get them sat down and and you've probably got about 40, 45 seconds. Maybe somebody's in there working on a cut. You're trying to get your message across. It's absolute bedlam, the noise, the heat, everything. It's just so intense. And you know, when we get to crowds back, you know, I, I love it. I love going into the corners in between rounds when it's really getting getting interesting. I mean, are you are you just kind of trusting that when it happens, you'll know what to do? Or are you a, the kind of person who might like play scenarios out in your head and think about what you were doing in certain situations? Um, I'll try to be as, yeah, as direct and as calm as possible. Um, that's what I foresee. Which, or that's what I aim to do. Um, once in my once, well, you know the fight where I fought Craig McHugh and Emmanuel wasn't in my corner because Miguel Cotto was fighting the same night and Emmanuel was training him. Um, and Sugar Hill was in my corner and I was fighting Craig McHugh and the fight wasn't going my way for the middle rounds and I was getting I was getting a rollicking in the corner. I was going to say a bollocking. <laughs> That's what, in the corner from uh, Sugar Hill, and like the fight was just passing me by and it wasn't my it wasn't Sugar Hill's fault. It was just I wasn't there, um, but. Because it was Sugar Hill and he was relatively inexperienced at that stage, Emmanuel got a friend of his called James Strickland, um, who was a legendary cutsman, you know, um, one of the most experienced men, been in like a, a lot of world champions' corners, um, to come and do the corner with me. So the fight was over, whatever. I won the fight. And after the fight, um, he called me over and he said to me, Hey, come here. He said, We're so quiet spoken. I said, um, You see all that hollering and shouting in the corner? He said, That's no good. He said, When you come back to the corner, that's supposed to be your, your place of peace. You're supposed to get a rest there. You're having enough of a fight in the ring. Never mind when you come back to the corner. So he said, um, just remember that in the future. And that, that always stuck out to me. You know, and I remember, where, obviously, with Adam, he's very calm in the corner. Mm -hmm. he gets his point across two or three things, lets you have your rest, and out you go. Because that's, that's all you can do, really. You get you, just try and drill home a point. Wanna tell, tell. If your fight is making a mistake, tell him what it is and tell him what he can do to, to correct it and then tell him how to go about winning the fight. 
Yeah, we, we see corners a lot, Matt, and, and sometimes you hear kind of too many voices, you'll hear two voices, which always seems like a complete disaster. Um, sometimes it is quite dramatic um, and they don't, and they're showing what you would, like Andy just said there, you know, it's not peaceful. But other times you feel like there's not enough urgency. It, it's it, it's a real difficult balance to strike, I think, sometimes in certain like- situations. I mean, I think, you know, if you've had a bad round, let's say you get put down or hurt or whatever, the last thing you need coming back to the corner is panic because you, you, it's only going to panic you even more. You know, if you had a bad round or the fight's slipping away from you, you, you want to you someone to say, listen, don't worry about that. That, that round's done that. It's over, forget about it. Let's, and, and then you want clear advice. And, and not, you don't want to be bombarded with 10 things to do. Like Andy said there, pick one thing. You're doing this wrong. This is what you need to do. You got 60 seconds, you know, in that 60 seconds, you're trying to bring your heart rate down, get your breath back, get a drink. You know what I mean? It, 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 especially if you've had a tough round, you don't want panic going on. And even if you, you feel it, you know what I mean? And you, you know, you don't need anyone telling you you had a bad round. You know you had a bad round. You know what I mean? So, you know, you, you know it, being relaxed is key, I think. In, and, that, and that's why when I mentioned earlier about Buddy McGurk, what will he bring to the table? Buddy's very relaxed. He's very experienced. He's been at the highest level. He, he's not going to get excited. You know what I mean? He's not going to get... Uh, he's not going to get panicked no matter what happens in the corner he will not be panicked he'll be relaxed and that, that that's that's i think being relaxed and uh calm in the corner is one of the most important things of course if it's a close fight and it's nip and tuck and you know you, your guy might need a knockout then you know you need to be told that but panicking and screaming and shouting and bollocking i don't i, I personally myself i don't i don't i don't get that i don't think it serves any purpose do you think this is one of those areas where having been a, a fighter yourself as a trainer is really helpful? Because it, across all sport, really, over the last 20 years, things have changed a bit. Actually, boxing's kind of... Boxing's, boxing's been ahead of the curve in, in that regard for a while because it's not always been the case that all top trainers were, were top fighters. Of course, we, 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 we know that, but... When it comes to having a fighter sat down in front of you in the corner and they've had a real hard round, the fact that you've sat in that stool and you know what that's like, it, 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 do you think the two? Do you think that's really important that that your fighter knows that you know what they're going through? Um, you know, you, you you could make a strong. A lot of people would say, yeah, you, you do need to know, but then you look at a guy like Angelo Dundee. I don't think Angelo Dundee ever boxed yet. He was a great corner man, very calm, very relaxed. You know? Maybe he'd have been even better though if uh, if uh, if he'd been a fighter. <laughs> Maybe. What does Andy think? Yeah, Angelo and Lee, great corner man. But uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and Muhammad Ali, pretty easy guys. I was sure, you know. I mean, well, like Pinkland Thomas and those guys, the other guys he trained. How did he do with those? You know, but yeah, I know. I think. It's always. It's, I don't think it's a it's a necessary requirement, but it is. A, it can only benefit, can it? You know, it can only benefit you. And um, to know, like to know, like Emmanuel used to be in the corner. You don't like he could read your mind, Emmanuel. He could read. He could read the opponent's mind. Like whenever you, whenever he'd say to me, like go and get him out of there this round. If I just put up, applied a little bit more pressure, I'd win by it. Like I get this, I would get him out of there. You know, or but it, even when other people would be screaming outside, like get him, knock him out, dude. Go, oh, he's ready, he's ready, oh. And I said, just hold on now, hold on a little bit more. Just keep boxing the way you're boxing, and keep keep using your jab and wait one or two rounds. And like, it is, it's a, it's an art form, and um, it's it's the only thing you can learn by experience. Though you know, it's only like it's not like you can't practice for it. You can practice for it in the gym, but it's not the same. You have to be under the lights. You have to be in that situation. You have to be in the pressure cooker. It's the only way to learn. I've done corners. I've done like I've done obviously the lads who I train now. I've done Tyson's corner, but I was a second. And I've been in the corner with Emmanuel numerous times and Adam do. So um, I think I, I think I know what to do. Like me and Joseph have been talk, obviously we've been training, he's been sparring, I've been repeating the same phrases to him for eight weeks now, daily. So he knows if I say one word, what it means, what it triggers in him, and what what I mean. That there's a shorthand of language there, you know. So that's I'm I'm backing on that. Do you do you feel nervous, Andy? Because this is probably the most pressure situation as a trainer that you've been in to date, would you say? Yeah. 
I, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I don't feel nervous. I'm quite. Um, you know, we. Tr I I work extremely hard myself with him, and he's worked extremely hard. And I've like I've done everything I, I physically, and and mentally, and any other way I can do it. I've done all I can. So we're quite happy with that. And if he wins this fight, it was because of that. If he loses the fight, it wasn't because we didn't do anything right. You know, or do do all or anything that I can. You know. Um, like I'm not, I'm not like I don't claim to know it all the things that I don't know about. Like you know, I, I would ask Tyson, or I would ask Sugar Hill, or things like that, and they they would re re. Uh, what's the word? Like they would, they would like if I'd say, well, what do you think I was thinking about doing this with Joseph? And they would say, yeah, that's the right thing to do, you know. And um, I don't know what what they they. Uh, I can't think of the word what I'm trying to say now, but reinforce your, what you already know. There you got me, Matthew. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like Manny Stewart. I could read you, man. I could yeah. read you. I was good reading you. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> so, so I guess as a trainer, it's it's kind of the, the same as it is with a fighter in a way. In that, if you arrive in fight week feeling like you've prepared really well, then is it possible to to relax? A bit because you can yeah. just think well this is this is kind of what will happen will happen now and you don't have total control over anything once the bell goes um joseph is a relaxed guy anyway you know he's he's, he's not i think you you take care of the like my manager was always take care of the big things at the small like like take care of the small things like your hydration your sleep and x y and z when the big things just let them happen you know because there's no point worrying about it really um when he leaves that dressing room, it'll be time to get serious, time to switch on. But up to that point, we'll still try and stay as, as relaxed as we can. Um, yeah, I don't like, there's no point in, it's only a fight, really. It's only a fight. He's done it plenty of times before. I'm not, like, it's not, and like, what am I going to do? Give him some order, to give him some instructions, to get out there and fight. That's it. Like, no, anyway, it's not, it's not, I'm not fucking curing cancer. I'm not doing heart surgery. <laughs> no, you know, I'm playing him right. I'm glad I'm ready. He's going to go out there. He's going to win or lose, and that's it. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I don't know where I seen it, or I can't remember where I heard yeah. it or something. But I remember someone saying, you know, I don't know, whatever fight it was, they're going, you know, this is the biggest fight of your life. This is this, this is that. Really hyping up, and then going, and also it's just another fight. You know what I mean? You're going to go in the ring. It's just another fight as well. He's got two arms, two legs. It's a fight you've trained for. You know what I mean? All you've got to do is execute everything you've been doing, and you're going to win the fight. You know what I mean? And it, and it, it's it's back to that. <laughs> Be relaxed, but don't be lackadaisical, isn't it? It's, it's a big fight, but it's just another fight as well. Well, he's, he's taking care of all the small things, so, you know, hopefully he'll have a good result, really. Um, but it is really, like, you know, the thing is, because it's a fight, it's on TV, and I've said this before, it's in the ring and there's lights and there's music and everything. You tend to put it on this pedestal, but it's no different from what happens in the gym. It's not actually, no, they're no different. It's like they got, they got small gloves on, they might punch a little bit faster because of that. You got no head gears, but like when you, they don't, like when you're up close to a fight, you, it's it's not as impressive as as it looks on. You know, it's not. It's just, it's just, there's two guys in there trying to win a fight, and that's it. It's not, you know, the, the glamour is kind of taken out when you get there close. When you're that close up, close in person, you're hearing the thuds and the sweats and the grunts and the, you know, it's, it is just two guys trying to point, just trying to hurt each other. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> how how have you been? Yourself, Andy, and this. I remember a few years back now, it's gone that quick, but when we we had a, we were working for Sky at the Copper Box and we went for a bit of grub and we were chatting and different things. You were, I think that time you were training Paddy Donovan or you were about to and that. And I was going to maybe train Joe's Ward. I told you how that had gone and everything. And I, you, what, you know, watching interviews, watching you doing bits with Joseph and out reading things. Because listen, let's face it, when we retire, a, a little part of us. You know, dies a little bit, doesn't it? Even if we're ready, and you seem like you're really alive again. That you, you know what I mean? And you, 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 you're loving what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, it is. It's like a, a second, second life, I guess. You know what I mean? It is. I, I, like, I, I was, like this is like before Tyson went to Vegas. The night of two nights before, he came over to. We were staying in one of Tyson's houses. And he came over and he just said that, like he just called him around and he chatted for three or four hours. That's how he is, you know. And he was like, he was, he was a uh, almost, uh, I don't know, he was jealous of me because I've had a second, I've got a second career, you know. And he was just saying how lucky I am. And, and 
And then, you know, somebody else saying it to me kind of made it realize, yeah, I am actually very lucky to to have this kind of second second thing. And like, it is, it's mad, it's mad. Like, who knows which, where, where it'll go. Listen, I'm, this is my first real big, big gig. And if it's success, success, everyone's going to be saying, oh, he's a new great coach. But if it's a failure, that's it. It's all, you know what I mean? It'd be very hard to come back. And that's, that's the way it is. As a, you live and die on your results. And um, no one will want to hear about, oh, we only had eight weeks. Oh, it's blah, blah, blah. As like, it's all well and good being the, the, you know, the hottest new thing, but only if it goes well. Like if, if Joseph loses the fight, then, then he'd likely to go back to New Zealand. He's likely, who knows when he's going to fight again, what will happen, whether he'll retain me as a coach, who knows. Um, but if, I, if Joseph wins the fight and looks good, then all of a sudden, oh, there's this new hot coach in boxing. So it's, it's fickle, you know, and um, I don't, I, who know, you know, who knows this way to go, you know what I mean? That's, that's just the way it is, isn't it? You know, everyone has their day in the sun. Like for a while, it was Ben Davidson. And then Adam Booth, Dave Caldwell, Shane Wiggins still doing well. Like all these coaches, you know, that that are coming and going and all of a sudden they're the hardest thing and then all of a sudden you now fire's looking for a different coach, you know. So it's it's just I don't I don't know what way to take it, but I am very I am I am lucky to have it. My wife's not thanking me though for being away all these years <laughs> weeks, but she didn't buy in for this one, you know, once I retired. Um, but uh I don't know. I'll try and set myself up in Dublin in the future. I think you know. Yeah. I mean, if I, you just described there the kind of yeah, the almost quite arbitrary nature of it, really, because we all know that really odd things can happen in sport all the time. And um, it reminds me of I remember seeing an interview with a golfer who went out and had a great round in the final round of the Open. I don't think he won, but he had a great round. And they're saying to him beforehand, "Oh, you must have felt amazing today when you got to the course." And he said. I went out to the practice ground and I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't hit the ball straight. So I just scrapped it after about five minutes. It was a fucking shambles. Um, and then he said, so how do you explain, how do you explain how you played? And he just said, well, this is how this is. You you go out there, you do your best and whatever happens, happens. And and <laughs> it just really made me laugh the kind of, the the, 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 the it could be that random. Because when you're, when you spend your life studying it like me, but, but not doing it, um, you get this like, I don't think it anymore, but you get this idea that everything's kind of military and precise and scientific, and it's just not. I mean, it's just not like that, is it? But the question I was going to ask is: Do do you both think that fighters are quite? Um, I don't know. Are they are they kind of quite easily led and blinded by by who is seen to be the next big thing or who is seen to be the the next kind of hot coach? Do, do some of them maybe not really? research it all that much when it comes to deciding who they want to be their trainer do they just think well he trains him and he's really good and he's won a load of fights so yeah let's do that that's basically how i got the job on me he, <laughs> rang, I, he rang tyson and tyson said yeah lad he trains me he's good so go with him so joseph said okay <laughs> so you're right maybe your point is right <laughs> that wasn't what i was driving at but um but um <laughs> macklin does that make sense what i said uh, well, well, as Andy said earlier, Ryan, he said fighters are always looking for an edge, and and at a point when you're, you're I don't know, you're pro seven, eight, nine, whatever many years, you know the the the, the rate of improvement or the little bits you can improve on are going to be minimal, but those little bits can make the difference. Can be the difference between winning and losing as you go up the levels. I'm guessing someone like Josie Parker's obviously spoke to Tyson Fury. You know, you know, he trusts his opinion. He'll, he'll know who Andy Lee is, former world champion. And, you know, Andy's, oh, me and Andy, our careers kind of ran parallel at times. I always, he always struck me as someone that was very analytical, very much a thinker, you know what I mean? And that can be a curse to us because I'm a thinker too. And I could be up all night thinking <laughs> instead of just relaxing and sleeping. But you know what I mean? It's, you, 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 if you've got someone that's going to train you, I, I would want someone, I'd, I'd like to know that they're, They've covered all angles. That that they that they are analytical. That they've thought of every eventuality. That that they know me. They know what I'm good at. What I'm not good at. They know what we found. You know what I mean? Because we're all we've all got strengths and weaknesses. And it's and and, it, and it's knowing what your fighters. It's as important to know what your fighters not good at as it is to know what he's good at. Do you know what I mean? And and I, in my opinion, there's no point trying to for something if he can't do something he, he, he might just not be good at that you know so let's box to his strengths and and let's fight, fight in a style that protects his weaknesses or doesn't 
leave them exposed, you know, and try and make the game plan that way. But training a fighter and getting the right fit, it's a lot more than just your style and your, your technical personalities come into it as well and being happy and comfortable and, and believing in your trainer and having the trainer believe in you. Because when you if you if you've got faith in this trainer and, and he believes you, that makes you believe in yourself. And believing in yourself is probably the most under talked about part of boxing. You know, it's it, well, it, it, it's I don't know if it's under talked. It, 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 you know, everyone talks about it, but it, but it's it's, it's it's absolutely essential. And 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 having your trainer believe in you that that's key. What, one thing I've always kind of wondered about Andy when it when it comes to coaching of any kind really is is the the division of time between the division of time spent between trying to strengthen weaknesses um which could come at the expense of kind of weakening strengths um are you the kind of how easy is it to look at someone and just see what they can't do as opposed to what they, what they can? Um, I don't know if I'm really making too much sense, but, but I, I remember talking to a football coach a while ago and he did say to me, you know, he felt that the mistake that some people made was they would look at a kid and just see what they couldn't do, spend all their time trying to strengthen weaknesses. And in the end, it eroded the skills that they did have and ended up weakening their strengths. That's actually quite a good interesting point because maybe I've gone the wrong way about this. <laughs> uh, I think to go hand in hand, if you're strengthening a the weakness, then you're making your fighter a better fighter, aren't you? You know, um, I think you can do both um, in terms of, yeah, I think, I, I think to go hand in hand, I think, the, I don't know if there's a difference really because if you're strengthening a weakness, if he, like in boxing anyway, if he's, carries his hands lower if he doesn't step his feet a certain way and you change that and he corrects it then he's added a new strength I don't know yeah I, I think it's that's a funny one but I, I mean there was um we always go back on our own personal experience don't we to to, 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 to get an answer sometimes but if I look back when I went with Billy Graham when I went with him, there were certain things that I definitely needed to add to my game, things he noticed from me and said, look, you're very, you're a bit mechanical. You need a bit more rhythm. You, you, you know what I mean? You're too stiff. All, all these little things. And over six weeks, it was difficult to make those changes. I felt really uncomfortable changing my style, how I hold myself, my balance. It felt really uncomfortable. And I felt, I felt shit. Even when I was hitting the pads, the brakes, I felt terrible and uh, inspiring that I was trying to incorporate into my style. And it was difficult. But over four years, I completely changed. But maybe to the extent that I, I did add a lot of things. My head movement, my bed up was better. My anticipation, covering the canvas with my feet, cutting the ring off, all that sort of stuff. But I think I became too much that way over a period of time and, and actually neglected my long range skills, my jab, things like this. Now, that wasn't something that he tried to do, but in focusing so much on areas that were my weaknesses, I think over a period of time, I neglected uh, other things that had worked so well for me up until that point, you know? So I think it's what you focus on, isn't it? If, you, if you're trying to, if you're focusing so much on a certain aspect, um, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many, there's only so much change you can achieve in a session. You're in the gym an hour, you're getting fitness, you get tired. You know what I mean? And you do the same again and again. There's, yeah, it's a funny one because you, you, you do want to work on weaknesses. Of course you do, but you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to completely neglect your strengths either because I don't think that they'll become a weakness, but you just maybe stop using them. Yeah, I think I think that was that was that was kind of what I was I was um, I was driving at really. Um, just got a couple of questions, a couple more questions about the corner um, before we move on to just a, a bit of a chat about uh, about Katie Taylor's fight um, and a couple of other things. I'll take you back to when you were fighters. Now, when you sit on that stool in between rounds and it's been a hard round, how much can you really even hear? let alone absorb from your trainer. I remember talking to Jim McDonnell when we went to see Jim in his garden mat a while ago. Uh, and he said that he just firmly believes that the fighter will only remember or be able to take on board 
the last thing that he hears in the corner. Because you see, this is like a, this is truly an experience that, that that non-boxers will never have. Like you're sat on that stool and it's been rough. What what is your mental capacity at that point? <laughs> Go ahead, man. Um, look, it, you know, it, it, every round's different. You know, have you had a good round? Have you have you been buzzed? Are you still it's, buzzed? It's been, it's, it's, it's been rough. It's been a difficult round. It's been hard. Yeah, look, I think the first, the, the, you know, the first 20 seconds, that 60 seconds is just sitting down, getting calm, controlling your breath, getting your getting your drink of water. And then, yeah, the, the, there's, no, there's no point the trainer bombarding you with loads, with five or six different things. It's not going to go in. Do you know what I mean? Obviously then, as you're coming to the end of that minute and you've had your drink and you've got your breathing kind of back in control, really then that's when what, whatever's said to you then, that's going to be the last thing that you remember. That's going to be at the forefront of your thoughts going out into the next round. So, yeah, there's, I think, what Jim said that day, I, I get what he's. I get. I definitely get where he's coming from. Yeah, I, I would agree. And some, like sometimes you're dealing with the fight. <clears throat> if it's been rough, you've obviously been hurt, um, and you, you know, you physically might not be feeling that well. And then you're worried about that. And then you're also worried about losing the fight. And you're also worried about people who you love are watching the fight and how they're feeling. So there is a lot going on, you know, and. There's a there's a whole load of things going on, and um, so it is a lot to handle when you're in that corner or when you're in the corner. So yeah, I, I I would say that I wouldn't he wouldn't say it's too far wrong. That's something the last thing you hear that that really really matters. But you still have to go through the through the routine of telling them you know telling them what they're doing wrong or and not even you don't even have to focus on what they're doing wrong. Just tell them what they're doing right or how they can improve. You know. Um, but yeah, it is. It is. Every every round is different. Every fight is different. But when it's when you're under pressure and you, you're you're soaking it up, it's <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a you know it's a quick minute because you don't you want it to be a long minute, but it's a quick minute. It flies by and all of a sudden you're back out in the middle of it. You know, back out in the middle in the fire again. God, that's mad that you could be sitting there thinking about you know other people watching and then being worried about you losing and worried about losing the fight and all these things could just bombard you at once. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's wild. Like uh, how, how the fuck are you supposed to get your head around that? If you, if, if you're, if you're sat on a stool and, and someone's trying to talk to you and you're trying to listen it's to them. The, it's just an inner monologue. You know, you, you've, if you've been hurt, but you're walking back, your legs are sore, your legs are stiff, your legs aren't under you. You're walking back. Okay. Get your legs together. Get your legs together. Get your legs together. Okay. Sit down. Can you control your control it? Like, and then like, oh shit, I'm losing the fight. Oh no, shit, man, what am I gonna do? Uh, you know, it's just is that the yeah, way? That's that's how it is. That's how it is. You know what I mean? It's just you're in, and then the sudden there's some side pretty and he's saying, you, okay, now, okay, you get your hands up, get your breathing, you know, blah blah blah. So the water, you know, and then the, all of a sudden the referee's over. Is he okay? I'm giving you one more round. I'm giving you one more round. All right, I'm going I'm okay. I'm okay. Don't stop the fight. I'm back. At, you know, you're back. At, like that's basically it. That's how it goes. You know what I mean. Well, that's, I mean, that, that's, that, that's he's what you just told me. He's yeah. literally as manic as that. This is what I was wanting to know. This is exactly what I was driving at. Is 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 is, is perfect. That that's yeah, chaos. Like sometimes yeah. it must feel like chaos, and you've got someone else jerking your head around, telling you to keep still because they're clamping a cut and they're trying to get the adrenaline in, and you're jigging your head about, and there's all sort, and then you hear ten seconds, and then the stool comes out, you're back on your feet someone splashes a bit of water on you. I mean, it's just mental. You know, it looks to me like it is anyway. It just looks totally mental. Get out there, get out and fight. You know? That's what I mean, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's it's absolute chaos. That's why the last thing you need is a cornerman that's panicking. Do you know what I mean? You, that's why if someone can be, you know, if you've got this panic or this chaos going on and you've got someone then that's very calm and brings you back down, it, it, do you know what I mean? That that can, That's a very understated asset you know, to have, to, to, to bring someone back down and listen, don't forget all that. Just focus, relax, get back out there. And because, you know, all the stuff that you do in the ring, it happens instinctively 99% of it. Do you know what I mean? It's already ingrained into you. All the movements, all the combinations, the patterns of movements, they, they just happen instinctively. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's just getting back into a mental state, which is calm and relaxed that you, you can let that flow. Yeah, it's like, sometimes I've, I've, I, I, 
it reminds me almost of like what well, I'm, I'm not a big F1 fan, but it reminds me almost of like watching a pit stop. You've got this guy flying around the track, and then all of a sudden, off he nips, stops. There's this m- hive of activity. Everybody knows what they're doing, but it's 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 quick. And then all of a sudden, it's you know the the green sign goes around and off you go again. It's just uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, let's just have a quick chat about uh, about Katie Taylor and Tasha Jonas because that that's a you know it's a it's a great fight that and one that we have been waiting for really ever since Natasha turned pro one which looked like it was kind of dead when when she got beaten by by Vivian Obanalf and it's an interesting one this for me because I, I, what I often think when you've got a kind of a rivalry like that or you've got UK fighters British and Irish fighters is a kind of try and think what this would look like if 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 Natasha Jonas wasn't British and they hadn't fought in the Olympics. On paper, what you've got here is Katie Taylor, undisputed lightweight champion, taking on somebody who was drawn for a world title at the weight below. Now, when you describe it like that, it doesn't sound quite so good, but but I do make Jonas a live underdog in this fight. How about you two? British hype. British hype. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Katie's a strong favourite, but I, but I, I wouldn't completely write Tasha off because I did that before going into the Terry Harper fight. And she's never stopped going on about it, so yeah, I can see. I, you, you've you, you've weakened Macklin. You've uh, you know she's she's got you on the run. Yeah, she made me eat my words that night, and, and and she hasn't stopped reminding me about it since. So you know, look, it's boxing. You know, it, it is boxing, and Natasha is a good fighter. She's um, very competent, but. I think Andy Lagrumi, Katie Taylor's special man. She's special. I, it's, Katie is is a special like an athlete, special box, special special person. But Natasha's style, um, that cover up and uh, like and catch and counter style, if Katie holds her feet and like does those three or four punches where she's like ah, and catch catches one, two, three, and then boom on the fourth one with a right hook. Don't forget she's a southpaw. And Katie, if Katie leads with her right hand and even if, if she can time on Natasha and counter with the right hand hook at the same time, could could be a couple of from some problems in there. I think you know. I think um, I don't. With female fighting, though, like at, at this level, it's evenly matched, isn't it? You know, most of them are evenly matched in the two round, two minute round. So they're gonna, it's gonna be fast paced, and so there's not gonna be a lot of room to be strategic or to be methodical. It's gonna be a sprint, and um, sometimes I think Katie gets caught up in all of that. And if Natasha can, can time it. It, like who knows which way you know she, I I think it's because she might get, be able to catch Katie once twice three four like throughout the fight but to be able to be consistent with it to be able to beat Katie I think it, it's a big ass but I do, do think it'll be interesting at some stages in the fight yeah yeah I, I was thinking in, in that kind of fight I think three minute rounds would probably suit Jonas more um for the for the reasons you just kind of outlined there I the way she boxed against Terry Harper was was yeah I really really enjoyed it I really kind of enjoyed that enjoyed that style and and uh, if she could do what you just said there then 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 it could be interesting because I think that is something that Katie Taylor does tend to do is is every now and again but get a bit carried away with the with the kind of relentlessness of it um, because she can kind of overwhelm overwhelm fighters. Um, but there's no real sign, Matt, is there, would you say, that that she's 34 now, Katie, uh, been boxing for a really, really long time, under enormous pressure for for almost all of that. And that's not to be underestimated because the, the, the mental toll of that is, well, it just has to take its toll at some point. But I wouldn't say there's any clear signs that she's she's kind of going down the other side of the hill. No, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, you never know, do you? Like I said, she's, she, she's not getting any younger, but she's... She's such a clean liver, you know, and she's always stayed in shape. And, you know, there's longevity when you live like that. You know, you burn a candle at both ends. Obviously, you don't, but she, she, Katie Taylor's consummate professional, never ballooned up in weight, you know, nothing like that. So I, I, I think she's a fresh, she's fresh for her age. And for the amount of fights she's had, I think that she's still quite fresh. So just finally, then, um, we can't let you go without talking a bit of a bit of fury, a bit of fury, Joshua. Uh, we're not going to talk about where the fight's going to be, when the fight's going to be, any of that kind of thing, because none of us know. And 
I think even Eddie's beginning to run out of kind of place holding material, if you like. He's he's really good at kind of announcing having a pre-announcement for a pre-announcement for an announcement and making it sound like an announcement. He, he, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's the master at it. But um, I, I think Tyson's over in Vegas at the minute. Um, it, it's either kind of, I mean, it, it kind of seems to me, Andy, that, that he's the kind of character who will cope with this sort of uncertainty of when it'll be, where it'll be, will it even happen pretty, pretty well. Because that, I mean, that could become a thing. You know, mentally that could get quite, quite draining. You're expecting this to happen, and so you start camp, and but have you really started? No one really knows. Is that something he'll just he'll he'll take in his stride easily enough? He's constantly training anyway. Um, I don't think he like going into camp is just. I think I don't. It's no different from the way he lives his life day to day. But it's just the fact that he's removed himself from his family. I think going to Vegas has been good for him to get a break mentally as much as he's not getting a break physically, but mentally to just get a change of scenery and do different things um, because he'd been in Markham for over a year since the, the Wilder 2 fight. Um, I think I think he's fairly frustrated, to be honest with you. Um, not to give anything away. I think he's I think he's expressed that. He's fairly frustrated with um, things that, like, you know, the deadlines that were supposed to be met and keep looking for extensions and X, Y, and Z, but I, I know he just he just really wants to get the fight on. Um, and there's always there's like you know yourself all these promises until you got something in my you like until you get something in paper, and even then until you're like in at the week of the fight and you're in the venue and kind of thing, and even, and even then until you're on the scale, you know what I mean? It's like a lot can happen in this case, you know, you're never really certain. And so he's had a lot of this in his his career promises, and you know trying to get the first critical, trying to get the physical fight initially, years of waiting for it. And so he's had some experience with this, but it is frustrating, I think, for him. Yeah, Matt, that's, it, it's got to be, um, yeah, it must be frustrating. And it's, Joshua's always in, in in pretty good shape from from what we can tell. So going into camp for him, I guess it's similar. It's not, it, maybe it's not that big a deal, but at the same time, he does tend to like to have a long lead time. Um, fourteen week camps. It, maybe it's more of a maybe it's more of a problem for him than than Tyson. Kind of not knowing when this is going to when this is going to happen. The longer this goes on. Yeah. Look, I think you know you got you got to be careful about overtraining. But you know that, that sometimes you know you can take a few days off and you can be a bit fresh again with rest. But emotionally and mentally you can burn out as well you can go stale so I think look the fact that Tyson's gone over there to Vegas freshen things up change the scenery you know when he does come back then to Morecambe if that's where he's going to do the bulk of his training you know it, it won't feel like he's already been there for so long training going to the same gym every day we gets you know training for a fight it can be monotonous and boring do you know what I mean you, you, you're going over the same things you, you're drilling you know they call it drills because you're drilling it in you know what I mean so and, and you're physically getting fit. But look, he's the heavyweights. They ain't got to worry particularly about making weight. Although, you know, I'm sure he has an optimum fighting weight where he wants to be. But me- I think mentally and emotionally, and that's the, I think that'll be the key for this fight. For both of them, not, not to get not to, to start too soon. Not to kind of crank up the, the, the training too soon and, and, and get to a place where you're kind of, you're a few weeks out from the fight and you're kind of sick of training. Do you know what I mean? You want to be, you want to be building to that peak. You don't want to be getting a few weeks out from the fight and thinking, fuck, I'm sick of this now. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that's The thing is with, with Tyson, he absolutely loves training. Like he's, he's, it's like a, he's obsessed. Like he's just like, I don't know, he's a fanatic. Like he's like a, he's like some sort of psychosis where he just has to train all the time. And like no fight, nothing, nothing in like the pipeline. Back in February, training like a maniac, like, you know, pushing himself. <laughs> like, but like, I said to him, Tyson, why are you doing this for? You know, like I was trying to eat. He said, Andy, this is where I have to, this is where I like to get myself. Like I like to get myself in this place because I know I can keep fighting when I'm tired. And like this was after 17 rounds and he's just still drilling and drilling and drilling. I'm saying, Tyson, just come on. He's like, no, Andy, I need to keep pushing, keep pushing. Like he's, he's absolute. Like, and and that's when you see him, that's where you know where he is, why he is and where he is, where he is, you know, but he's just. But he also knows himself, doesn't he, Andy? So he'll know where to take a day or two off as well, I guess. 
Yeah, but he is. It is. It, is, it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. Um, overtraining. He's very. He is. He is very aware of it because it's happened to him in the past. Um, he. He. She. Like. So he. He has to be careful. He does have to be careful. But it's. It's a balance because I think a lot of the training is is for to keep him on a level. You know, mentally he he has to train and likes to train, but then you have got to counteract that with staying fresh and not being over overdoing it. But that's surely somewhere where you would really come in because you, you can see, you know, when, when you're in it yourself, sometimes you, you know, you know what I mean. When you've got a fight coming up, I know myself. I've been training for a fight, and I know about overtraining. But sometimes when I'm in that zone, I still want to do more, 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 more. Where you need someone who knows you, knows the game. Go, nah, nah, that'll do you. Take a day off. Sugar Hill's very good at like Sugar Hill is very good at that. Um, but he's he sometimes he can't like you said he, he can't help himself he just has to keep pushing he wants to keep pushing um, like he took the he took he's in Vegas he took the lads up Badu Jack a couple of the Mexican guys um, what's those Jesse Mandelano took him up this hill in Vegas a mountain up in Vegas what's it called anyway Mount Charleston yeah seven miles up all of them quit Tyson did seven miles and like was at the front all of them quit he said like he said Andy oh, these guys they want to be champions and they're quitting on they're quitting on me. All these like featherweights and the quitting up the hill. That's how hard he pushes. You know what I mean? Here he is, whatever he is, two seventy pounds. He's going up. Like, that's how he is. He just it's everything's a competition to him. Everything is a competition. He has to be the best. He has to win everything, and that's why he is the champion of the world, I guess. Yeah, I always love that. I always love the um, the sauna story with him and Vladimir Klitschko. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It was like like no one could stick that heat. <laughs> He did it. He did that. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it was it was a while, wasn't it? He was over there for a training camp. It was a while before. Uh, before... I love the psychology of that, though. Yeah. 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 He's always like everything's a competition. Like if I do, you know, if I'm doing if I do press ups, oh come on, how many can you do? X Y. You know, if I can do, chin, I'm doing chin ups. Oh yeah, I oh, come on, how many are you doing, Andy? I'll do. No, he'd try, and he'd have to beat me. I have to. Be, <laughs> and like, uh, it's funny. That's just how he is, yeah. So something quite strange has happened here because it's just popped up on my screen. It says Adam's iPhone six has entered the waiting room now. It just Adam, the room. A- Adam's iPhone six is um, that's Adam Booth, I'm pretty sure. So just, let's, just, get him in. Get him let's in. hang around, fellas. I'm just I'm going to admit him now and see and see what his game is. I don't know who he thinks he is. <laughs> interrupting this, interrupting this private, this private this chat. He's connecting now. I think it's a pocket call. I think it must be a pocket it's call. It's not a pocket not, call. Not, not a pocket call. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. How has this happened? <laughs> Adam Booth. Adam Booth has joined us. That's it. This has never happened on Macklin's Take before that we've had a star <laughs> mystery <laughs> guest unknown <laughs> even to me. I crashed it. <laughs> I, decode, I decoded the entry to Macklin's Take. <laughs> That's very, very clever. How are you doing? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I I can't wait to see uh, Joe Parker on Saturday. Now that Andy's training him, I'm I'm really excited about that. That's why I've jumped on the call. Plus the fact that I'm locked in my COVID testing room at the moment, so I've got 24 hours to kill. Of course, yeah. We might, yeah. With Michael, Michael's fight, Michael's fight. So we've been talking about, we've been talking training, we've been talking. I've been grilling these two about about the corner in between rounds, um, and what goes on there and how you manage to get your message across to a fighter amidst all the chaos. Um, and they've given me some interesting, some interesting answers. Uh, and one thing I, I put to them was something that Jim McDonald said to me a while ago, said to me a while ago, which was that the only thing the fighter will really remember is the last thing you tell them. You're pretty sparing with, with what you, what you tell your, your fighters in between rounds, or at least it seems like you are, because I mean, we can't, usually hear it because you're you whisper it in the ear but do you would you agree with Jim there do you think the last thing you say is is pretty much you know the only thing they'll be able to take on board well I will I will make a confession as well you know the boom mic that the the fella the sound guy lobs over your head yeah to come into the corner right and, and normally you never see it but now I always expect it so if I can if I get an opportunity just before as they sit down just before I take the gum shield out I swipe my arm above my head. So if the boom mic's there, I've knocked it out of the way so they can't hear. That's, what I, no- that, that's what I normally do. Um, but but, like, but like what you say in the corner should absolutely reflect what you've said in the gym hundreds of times. Because 
it's what you do in the gym that you use on fight night. And so you just use the same commands. Obviously you've got, you know, there's the fight scenario and the stresses and the, and the adrenaline and, you know, the fight could be hurt, could be tired. You've all, that's the first factor. Just make sure that they're breathing and drinking and calm. They, they have that mental rest. And once they've had the mental rest, just tell them one, maybe two things. That's why I'm interested to see Andy on Saturday night. Cause I think that I, I think Andy's knowledge and character combined, um, uh, will make him a, a really excellent coach. I really do. Well, actually, one one, one thing he was we, we were talking about as well was the the fact that you know there's there's, there's two aspects to training, or, or more than that, most likely. But one is the gym, and the other is fight night. And you're never really totally sure what you're going to be like in the corner when it when it gets when the shit starts flying until it happens to you. Um, was was it, was it like that for you? As a coach, yeah. Well, the first time you found yourself in the corner on the night with David, say, and it wasn't all going your way, and you think, "Fuck, what do I, what, what am I going to do now?" It, well, is, yeah. is it that kind of experience? Mm, I would no, I wouldn't say. You know, it's not. It's not like that. When you're in it, you're in it, and there's you know, you know, people get hurt. You help bring them back round. Why? Why? I, I think I have. Um, accepted a long time ago is that when you walk to a fight anything can happen absolutely anything and as long as you're in that in that sort of emotional space and mental space where you're just prepared to accept anything that's going to happen um it gives you a better it gives you a better sort of a better grounding to be able to read the fight and say what you need to say without reacting emotionally to what might happen because just like a like a fighter a fighter has to be prepared for anything that's going to happen so a coach has to be likewise including defeat including any potential Is outcome that, but, but no because when you're in the fight you're not you, you, but when you're in the fight and you're coaching someone in a fight you're not thinking about the end you're thinking about the now that's all you're thinking about is the now. And even if a fight has been dropped or hurt, you're still thinking about the now and how to get back from that. And you never switch that off. So you, you, you never, the thought for me, honestly, the thought of victory and defeat never comes into my mind during the course of a fight. It's about doing what's got to be done. So Andy, from your point of view, when, when you look at the, I mean, you had Emmanuel Stewart and, and Adam Booth and you've been around other trainers, of course, it, do you try and take, do you try to take bits from them, from other people, or just try and figure it out for yourself, do it your own way? No, uh, of course I do. I lean heavily on on their influence, and um, the, but both in different ways because Emmanuel um, was so such a part of my formative years that it's it's like it's like the influence of a dad or of a you know of a parent or a brother because. No, you find yourself doing things that they did or saying things that your dad says just because you've been around him so much. But with Adam, um, even now I'll ring Adam. Even now, like, I'll text Adam and ask him a question about boxing. And even as you've seen the little answers to this quest, few questions there, it's always an education. And he's, he, verbal, he can verbalise it better than anything that me and Matthew just said, I, I think. Even though he said the exact same thing, he just said it in the most precise way. <laughs> and... Uh, no. You got there quicker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, no, um, I definitely, obviously, lean on Adam a lot and the techniques he touched showed me and um, the, even like the physical drills and the circuits. And I keep sending in these videos of the guys doing the circuits that Adam showed me and uh, <laughs> just tell them how much they love them. <laughs> As I said, I, said to, I did an interview with Rob, uh, Rob from Box and Social, but I said, these guys are just getting the water down Adam Booth. And that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, Adam, did you always think that 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 this would be the path that Andy would take? Because I remember me and Matt talking to him um, really early when we started doing this. So it would have been kind of like March 2019. And he was thinking about it. They both were. I think Matt had come close with, with Joe Ward and they were both kind of weighing it up and thinking, yeah, I could see myself doing it, but it would need to be the right kind of person. It's a massive commitment. Not really sure after a life training and fighting, I really want to... I really want to go back to that. I mean, did you think he would? Um, I don't know. It wasn't necessarily something that 
we didn't really talk about it. And I, and I think he was, once his career as a fighter was over, he was just sort of content that he had, had achieved, you know, what he wanted to as a fighter and, and sort of as a man and, and to sort of make his security. But then obviously you're a long time retired, aren't you? A lot, so certainly a lot longer than you are fighting. But you never know if someone, because, because being a coach is ahead of a commitment you commit the same amount of time as the fighter and it can be the most unrewarding unappreciated role going certainly you know undervalued in terms of how the business views a coach but in in paddy donovan he's got he's definitely got genuinely got a world-class prospect there and that in itself is enough to give you the enthusiasm to get to the gym and want to be there. And if, and if, if he's still, if, if Andy has got like those happy steps when he goes to the gym, that he's enjoying what he's doing, he, he will be an absolutely formidable coach. He really will. Because like I said, he's got the knowledge. I, Andy, Andy says, Andy says that he, he learned stuff from me. You must never underestimate how much coaches learn from the fighters and must always learn from the fighters that they work with. And I, I learned a hell of a lot from Andy, not just from Andy because of Andy, but also the things that he learned from Emmanuel Stewart as well. And, and so my relationship with Andy was satisfying in so many senses because I wasn't just his coach. It was definitely a two-way stream of, of, um, of knowledge. So don't let him play that, play that down in any sense. Matt, you're nodding your head there. That that's 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 something you found, was it, when you were when you were fighting? That uh, I remember you talk about when you when you teamed up with Joe Gallagher and, and you joked with Joe that, um, well, I mean, it, you were kind of half joking, really. Um, that um, that you put him on the map. That you put him on the map. But you, you can't coach and fighter can collide sometimes, can't they? When they're they're sort of on the same in the same place in in their in their upward trajectory, and, and you're bound to learn things from from each other it's not always a strict mentor pupil type relationship maybe no exactly look oh, you know i joke when i when I, I said it in jest and i said i put him on the map but but that that period of time me beating alcott oh. back to back and then um you know crawler as well coming it, it, it kind of established joe on, on a level but joe certainly you know he fired back at me again in jest but he did get the best out of me when a lot of Sort, sort of big name trainers hadn't, and Joe did. So um, it, it, it is a, it's a, it's look, it's a special bond. I think when you when you train with, with somebody, if you, if you, if you get it right, if you get it right, obviously Andy and Adam got it right. That, that was a good bond there, and they're still friends today. Um, but yeah, look, you got you know Adam Booth, a very experienced trainer, but you got Andy Lee, who's an experienced fighter and a successful fighter at the highest level. And has been around Manny Stewart, who's trained X amount of world champions. So there's naturally going to be an exchange of experience and knowledge and ways of doing things and an outlook and how they see boxing, how they see training and preparation for a fight. So that, that that's just a given, I think. If you get two analytical people, when I, like we said, Andy's a thinker. Adam's obviously a thinker. He's analytical. He's got you know he, he thinks he doesn't necessarily just swallow what salad. There's critical thinking there. He's taking it in. Do I agree with that? Or is there another way of doing it? You know, that's going on. So you've got two people that think like that, sharing information. It's only going to have a positive result. So, Andy, do you... It's, it's, I mean, it's early days in, in your training career, but, um, I mean, I guess there's a good chance. There's got to be a good chance, hasn't there, that, that at some point down the road, it will be A. Lee in one corner, A. Booth in, in, in the opposite corner. That I mean, that's probably going to happen, you'd think, if, 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 if you're both staying it <laughs> together long enough. Funny, you know. well, what we do, Adam, if that, ha- that happens? I don't, I, I don't think it will, if I'm honest. Yeah. I don't think it will. You know, you know, um, you know my, um, well, I've, I've said that I don't necessarily want to coach for too much longer. Um, but if you've got, you know, a super bantamweight or a featherweight that's world ranked, it could happen. What if I get Isaac Lowe against Michael Conlon? That'd be funny. <laughs> <laughs> the two That'd be gypsies. Great. <laughs> That'd be great. I'd, love that. I'd be all over that. Well, I'll say this as well. Adam, Adam Booth planning his exit strategy there 
Adam, it doesn't happen. Every once boxing gets you, you never get out. That's it. You're done. You're not. You're not escaping it. Look, I, I was hoping no one would call me on that because what I'm saying now, I've been saying for the last six years. Then okay. you know, but but it, I, I, honestly, I have. I've, I've I've had enough of coaching constantly over the last maybe longer than six years, um, and then all of a sudden, Andy Lee came along. And it was Andy Lee's career. And then I thought, oh, hang on, okay, well, well, once Andy's done, then I'll, I'll definitely go off and do something different. Then Ryan Burnett comes along. I was like, all right, once Ryan... This, so, scenario, you never know. You can never say never. It's just, it's just this constant state of denial and, and fatigue. And I, I, Adam's done more for the Irish people. And then I think uh, <laughs> St. Patrick himself. <laughs> he's he's a, a two world champions from Ireland and he's going to have a third, hopefully, of Michael Conlon. Did you still enjoy it as much as you ever did, Adam? <clears throat> um, it's, it's about the people you spend your time with. I'm, I'm not interested in just coaching fighters. I'm, I'm, like I've said, I've got to have belief in them as people as well. It's, and, and I'm lucky that I'm in the position where I feel like I can pick and choose like that. But, um, but the people I work with, I enjoy. My, I'm going to talk about Andy again because I think you're letting him off the hook a little bit too much. My, my relationship with Andy was was definitely a unique one that I re, that, you know I will always look back fondly of, and, and like even the times when it didn't feel. I remember I remember when Andy dropped that. No, it was before Andy dropped down to fight John Jackson at light middleweight, which was in the May, I think. We stood at the start of the year in my kitchen. I remember the conversation where it wasn't going, the career wasn't going anywhere. There was no opportunity. He was a big punching southpaw that had already lost for a world title. So there was, all the strikes were against him because he was too much of a risk and not enough of a gain for people to fight. So we said, well, let's, let's try and go down to light middleweight and see if that opens up opportunities in two categories. We beat John Jackson stunningly. Then nothing happened again. It was like, really? That's all happened? All that. And all of a sudden, the yin and the yang lined up. I made a couple of calls. And he ended up with the Matt Korobov world title fight. And to say, you know, to say that was probably his last opportunity would be the truth. But that, and so that made that win even more pressured and even more, more special. But in, in, but thanks for calling me out on the bullshit there, Matt. That uh, <laughs> you're never out. No, Matt, Matt Clint's convinced that, that that the only way people leave boxing is in is in a coffin. Uh, Eddie Eddie said the same thing to him. Oh, I might not be in it that much longer. And he basically just said, you know, exactly, just called it bullshit. Uh, practically said the same thing to Bob Arum, even though Bob Arum hadn't even suggested that he does one out of boxing. Um, <laughs> but um, what, whilst I've got you all here, just keen to ask you about Eubank Junior because um, he just came into my head when you mentioned Matt Vaykorobov there. Um, where is he in his career, would you say? And I'll start with you, because did you not see him in the Las Vegas gyms or in the gyms in the USA when he was young and he'd been sent over there by his, by his dad to work with, you know, like Mike McCallum, and he ended up kind of working with the, with the Mayweathers. So you saw him when he... Am I right in that? You saw him when he was, he was young and really, really raw. 2006, it was a top-ranked gym, and um, I took notice of him. Obviously, uh, I just heard a commotion. We were doing pads in the ring and I heard a commotion. There was two guys in the ring getting in, like took the headgears off and taking the gloves off and still trying to fight each other in a spa. And it was him. So he, he is, he, like, I, I always kind of thought, yeah, he's like, he's not the son of a fighter. You know, these typical guys who come along who are just doing it because it's an easy option for them. Mm. He was actually over there in America fighting and uh, in the gym and, and <clears throat> learning his trade and, and, and it, you know, fact that he wasn't no punk that he didn't let this guy take a liberty with him uh, so that well at the moment i don't know where he is i don't i haven't really taken too much interest in his career in a while um i don't know he's fight you know he's signed with sarah Lins, he's fighting mark morrison i don't know much about mark morrison to be honest with you um ability like, ability wise though do you think he's is he because he's not won a world title yet do you think he do you think he will don't you know he's the ibl world champion I was aware of that, but um, I, I don't count that as a, as a as a world title. I hope James Tennyson and Mark Donlock don't hear this, and Eddie actually, and it's Sky, not, and anyone really. I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think he's, I think he's a, he's a good he's a, he's a, like 
he could be dangerous and he's making the entertaining fights with the right style but um, has he got ambitions of fighting the top guys I think I don't know I don't, I'm not sure where he is really Adam did he did he train did he train very briefly with you at one point yeah we did two fights together um, uh, uh, Summit Jetta and then Spike O'Sullivan oh, right yeah okay I remember those two I remember the Spike O'Sullivan fight anyway yeah, I mean, if 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 he's healthy, fit, and ambitious, he's a handful for anyone. And if you let him in, he'll let his punches go. Um, I think what weight is he now? Middle or super middle? He's back down at middle now. Middle, okay. I mean, if you saw how Liam Williams um, managed to expose certain things in Andrade the other week. Where you know once he once Andrade couldn't get rid of him, Liam Williams really tested Andrade's desire to be in there, and I thought Andrade kind of got away with it a little bit, um, and and with the energy that Eubank Junior can put on people, I think that's a that's a very winnable fight, winnable fight for him. Matt, what what do you make? What what do you make of? Um... What do you make of of where he is, and 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 also kind of how how he's gone about his career? I find that sort of fairly fascinating he's got he's got dad there who obviously has been there and seen and done it all and he's made some interesting he's made some interesting moves he's now signed with with Sauerland and although he hasn't got that world title he has made a lot of money out of boxing I mean you all want a world title when you when you start but you also you know it's called prize fighting for a reason you want to make some money and he's definitely done that yeah, look, I think Adam meant the key word Adam said there that I, I would associate with Eubank Jr. His energy, you know, stamina, you know, he's a handful, he's got a good chin. I think he's he's got desire, toughness, that he's got all the physical attributes. I think he struggles a little bit maybe with at long range boxing, a little bit, you know, Billy Joe kind of early doors, was, you know, and this is Billy Joe's a, a brilliant boxer, so maybe that's not a fair uh, comparison. But you know, if you if you can if you stand with him. I think, you know, at middleweight, I'll give him a chance with anyone, you know. Um, is he good enough at long range to, to, to get to Andrade? Maybe not in the first six, but possibly in the second half, he, he'll, I think he's be prepared to take one to give one, or maybe take a few to give one and get close and force the pace. I think that's how he beats somebody like Andrade. He's not going to outbox him, but certainly he's a, he's a physical specimen. I think he's, he's got the definitely will to win. Great, great energy, great stamina. I think there is big, big assets. Adam, with your manager's hat on, um, I mentioned the way the way his career has been navigated, and people do point it in and say, "Well, he hasn't won a world title, uh, but he has made a lot of money." I mean, as a the two things usually go together, or yeah, not always, but usually, usually one comes after the other. You win a world title, and then you make some defenses, and hopefully. That's where you really manage to to cash in. But a manager's job is to get the best possible return for for the fighter, isn't it? Financially, and on that front, they've done a pretty a pretty bang up job. Yeah, and they've and they've done it. They've done it in a way where they didn't try and make friends with anyone. You know, they didn't they didn't necessarily kiss ass to get favors. And so the way they did it was probably the hardest way to be successful in in. in in terms of a business sense, and and so, you know, his his dad um, has a big influence, and his dad proved that he was stubborn and resilient, and and had his own way of doing it with his career, and uh, he kind of did that. He's done it with his son, so yeah, if, if, you know, he made money. I think the um, I think the World Boxing Super Series was a real gift for a lot of fighters financially because it, it, it came along and it kind of injected almost a false economy for a brief brief period of time. So fighters were making excellent money off the Super Series. But the fact is that he was in position to accept the place in the Super Series when it came along, that he didn't he hadn't signed an exclusive promotional agreement that restricted his entry. So yeah, they've done I mean you can only you can only judge it when it's all said and done, can't you? And and in terms of earning money, they they've proved that they've led him the right way. Yeah, the World Boxing Super Series was was, uh, as you say, it, it 
it was the gift that just kept on giving for a couple of seasons anyway. And, and in terms of the fights and the quality of the fights and the excitement that, that they provided, it was it was tremendous. And it'd be interesting to see if that is going to keep going um, with Sal and teaming up with Wasserman, although I know the WBSS was always kind of separate from Sal and it was under a different sort of entity. There's all sorts of interesting things going on on the kind of TV and promotional front at the minute, which... Uh, which people will be wondering why me and Macklin haven't talked about this yet, but we can't really. There's just nothing. There's just nothing to. There's nothing official that we can that we can say about it. In um, in due course, we, you know, we will we will have some comments to make. I'd imagine, but um, yeah, it's. Are important. you guys the new zone commentating team? Or no? Yes or no? No. There's, there's been no official. <laughs> the, 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 I, I don't even know what you're talking about, Andy, because there haven't been. You know, there haven't been any official announcements. Um, interesting times, interesting times. Um, so before I let you go, uh, we'll extend, we've extended this one a bit because we had our mystery guest pop up and <laughs> I suspect, I suspect that Andy Lee has something to do with that. I saw him fiddling with his phone at one point, um, because, you know, cracking into the, the Macklin's take zoom call with our respective it backgrounds, um, is, is very, very difficult. It's very, very difficult because we are as savvy as you can imagine on that front. Um, it, we, it's impenetrable to hackers. Uh, let, let's get your thoughts, Adam, on the fight that Andy's involved with on Saturday, Derek Tidore against against Joseph Parker. And this is kind of, I, I would say, this is kind of a, this is a must win for for both of them. I certainly think it's a must win for, for Joseph because he's been treading water really Um for a while now and you could argue he hasn't beaten a fighter from in or around the top 15 uh since maybe Huey Fury Junior, Junior Farr I know was 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 well ranked but most people didn't know didn't know who he was so I absolutely uh, think he really does need to win I'm slightly reluctant to say it's a must win for Chisora because he's lost plenty of fights and <laughs> and um he still seems to get another big one how, how do you look at it I think Derek Derek has proved that maybe in the heavyweight division at the moment there is no such thing as a must win fight. Um, Derek's, I've, you know, I've, obviously I've studied Derek a lot over the years and know him. Um, I think he, I think Derek's going to try and use his energy early to gain a foothold in the fight. Uh, I'm not sure that Derek's engine is there anymore. So I think that Derek will certainly, no, Derek can tuck his head down and swing those heavy shots with anyone. Um, and sometimes, like, he'll give you an opening, but it's dangerous to touch or to try and take the opening in the early rounds because he swings so, you know, so freely. Um, so I think that Derek's going to try and start fast and unsettle Joseph. Um, but if Joseph stays composed in the early rounds, he'll certainly get, he could certainly get to grips with the fight. Um, slight, I, th I think probably slightly before the halfway mark, but Derek will be dangerous early. In terms of being a must win, you can't say that about Derek, maybe for Joseph because he's not from the UK. You know, maybe, he, but then again, he's such an entertaining character. You know, when you look at all the stuff he's done on social media, you could see him becoming a real popular fighter in the UK. Um, so who knows? Don't say he must win, but it is a, it's a, it's a, it's certainly an intriguing matchup. Yeah, his he's, he's, he's lockdown videos, Joe, <clears throat> Joseph Parker, absolutely tremendous. So, so final question, I've, I've, I've saved the most important one for last. Andy, how, how is the corner kit shaping up? Because I've been very impressed by the, uh, by the kind of doctor's, jackets that, that you've had in the corner that you've certainly had in the corner a few times for your fight so far i'm all over them uh, i think a bit of classic corner kit is absolutely the way forward um <laughs> and i very much to be hoping we'll see we'll see some more of that well, on saturday proper throwback stuff isn't it, Andy? Nice nice it, looks, it looks like john boy out of the champs <laughs> <laughs> I lost you there for a second. Uh, no, I think we're just going basic t-shirt this time. Couldn't get any uh, nurses' um, coats or what they what what they actually are is a nurses' uh, coat, and with plenty of pockets. I get the name embroidered on the back. Looks the part. <laughs> well, I'm disappointed. Uh, I'm not going to lie. 
Uh, I'm not going to lie. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been quite short notice, I suppose. So and, uh, maybe Joseph's more of a more of a T-shirt kind of a guy with, with, with the corner wear, the corner wear. I mean, uh, a lot of people don't... It's not don't... about me. It's not about anything else but winning the fight. And yeah, I know. I know. And that's that's obviously what you have to concentrate on. But but um, but for me, the corner kit really is important. Uh, <laughs> because I don't have nearly as serious a role in this whole enterprise as you do. <laughs> Uh, anyway anyway enough of my nonsense so uh, we will we will wind it up there this has been uh, this has been great fun andy thanks for your time you played it you spared us plenty of it and and adam thanks very much for your for your unexpected the guest re- appearance so the reason why I, the reason why i'm actually here is that i was trying to facetime andy because i was sitting with mick so i was trying to facetime andy didn't get through and then andy sent me a message saying uh he sent me a screenshot of you so I could, I obviously knew he was on Macklin's tape. Right, so right. So I said to Andy, "Oh, I'll I'll jump in as a guest." And I, it was only a joke. And then he sent me the link. <laughs> no, it's absolutely perfect. It's worked out ideally. It's worked out ideally. I can imagine him sending the screenshot of, of me. We'll, we'll come to, you know, with a, a, a caption along the lines of "I'm, I'm on Macklin's take again." Um, with this fucking guy again, it's just like yeah, he it's wasn't that nice. He wasn't that nice. <laughs> He's, pre- he's pretending he's read all those books. <laughs> yeah. Al, he said, I think Al, Al worshipping clown is what he said. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. I've been called worse than that. That's absolutely fine. Al worshipping clown. That's I'm not joking. so bad. <laughs> okay, chaps. Anyway, I better. I, I will let you go. I will let you go. Thanks very much. This has Thanks been great. Me um, Thanks for having me on, Matt. Thanks for having me on, Andy. Uh, Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Best yeah. of luck. Best of luck on the weekend with the fights you're, you're both in. You're both involved in. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We might have one more this week. Not absolutely sure yet. Um, we will let you know on that front. But thanks, thanks for tuning in as always. If you can get over to the YouTube channel uh, when you've got the opportunity, that would be great. And help us out by clicking subscribe. Um, that's building nicely, and we'll catch you again soon. Mm-hmm.